Well, thank you so much, Amanda and Maria and Kate. It's a pleasure to have you both with us. Thanks so much for doing this. I wanted to start, uh, I think, you know, I think most folks have an origin story for how they got into the field that they're in. And I'm really interested in people who, you know, went to work in fields where they were underrepresented, where you're not seeing people like you, where, you know, girls are less likely to turn to STEM jobs as they progress, the older they get in their educations. And so I'd, I'd love to hear from both of you briefly how you got started. Maria, maybe if you want to start what you got you interested in pursuing mathematics, computer science, despite very few women choosing that path at the time? Well, I think part of it was that I grew up thinking I was a boy and I played the trumpet. I didn't like dolls or nice dresses or anything like that. My father thought I was his son to the extent that uh, the first time I was pregnant, he looked at me and said, that's not physically possible. And, and so the fact that I liked mass and art and music, um, he just encouraged that. And in fact, I actually uh, signed up to study engineering when I started university, but because uh, I thought it was a way of combining math and science and art. But I switched the day before classes started because as I was registering, they told me that uh, engineers weren't allowed to take the top math classes and I wanted to be in the honors math classes. And so that's how I ended up in mathematics. And I will say that over and over again, my professors who are all male would say to me, uh, Maria, why do you want to be a female mathematician? There aren't any great female mathematicians. And of course, that made me want to do mathematics more <laughs> than I had before. So um, that's how that happened. Mm. That's really interesting. And, and I think as we look at what's happened over time too, the number of women getting computer science, like for example, computer science degrees has really sort of gone through this period of where it's changed a lot. It was increasing a little bit um, in the early, in the late nineties, early two thousands when you were going to school, okay. And now it's dropped off a little bit again in the mid 1980s, it, it peaked. And so it's really uh, moved over time. I, I'm wondering, Kate, what your origin story is. Why why you chose this path, and what made you stick with it, despite you know some of the barriers that Maria laid out. Yeah. So I, um, when I was in high school, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I just knew I liked math and I was fortunate. I had a high school calculus teacher who was a woman and she was very encouraging. So when I was looking into college, I just declared math as a major. Um, and when I got there, I took a computer science class and thought that was really fun. So I declared that as a second major. Um, I didn't really get into, you know, I, my expertise is in climate change. And so I started doing that in grad school. And that was sort of a combination of loving being outside and having this math, computer science, technical background. And so for me, climate change was a way to bring those together. But I, I'd say I've been really fortunate all along that I've always been able to see senior women in the field, whether it was my high school calculus teacher or um, people throughout my graduate school or um, professional career. And they've shown me an example of what that might look like. And so I think that was, I was very fortunate there. Yeah, I'm glad you're bringing that up because, you know, pipeline is such a huge part of this, right? And I know, Maria, there are probably few people who understand this as well as you do. You know, at Harvey Mudd, about half of computer science, engineering, and physics majors are women, which is an astronomical statistic when you consider, you know, nationally, only about 20% computer science majors are women. And like I said, that's a number that's actually been shrinking over time. Being able to see people in higher positions in the field is something that is relatively new. Um, I, I know, Maria, you've talked a little bit before about how there were a number of even cultural barriers you had to overcome, you know, combating ideas, people saying, well, if you accept more women or people of color, you're lowering standards at the school. How, how did you combat something as deeply ingrained as that? And what initiatives did you take on that you credit as being the most impactful? Well, um, yes, we certainly have had people say, including alumni, uh, that we must be lowering the standards because we've got so many women and so many people of color. Um, the reality is that when I arrived, we were admitting 37% of the people who applied. And now we're admitting around 12 or 13% of the people who apply. So I can tell you that the standards have not been lowered at all. Um, but I, I, it's definitely true that we, we need to change a lot of things 
because if you've been largely white and male for most of your existence, MUD was founded in 1955, first students arrived in 1957, and the vast majority of the students were white and male for probably the first 30 years. So there will be lots of things in your culture that privilege white males and uh, do the opposite to people who are not white and male. And so one of the things we've had to do is really think about how both how we teach and what we teach. And I think one of the biggest changes, uh, which was actually uh, done by the computer science department the year before I, lived, I arrived, so and done very deliberately to attract more women to major in computer science, was to change the intro course so that um, there was one section for the students who'd been uh, who'd never written a line of code and another section for students who'd done something like an AP course in computer science, uh, both called CS5. So the one, our colors are gold and black. And the one for people who'd never written a line of code was CS5 gold and black was for the people who had a, an extra, uh, who'd had some programming experience in computer science before that. And then we also added another section called CS42, which was for the people who'd been programming since they were 12 or <laughs> three or whatever. And, um, and we worked very hard to make sure that all of the sections were a lot of fun, but also that if you took black or gold, you were not privileged when you started the next course in the series, which is CS60. And for CS42, it combines five and 60. And so uh, we didn't have to worry about those students interacting with the students who'd never had any computer science before they came to college until they got to their third course in, in the series. Um, we did lots of other things. So we started taking uh, large numbers of female students to the Grace Harper uh, Conference uh, for Women in Computing. We, we also uh, encouraged tech companies to give them internships after their first year, not just the female students, but actually all students, because we know that at being able to see concepts used in real life increases retention for women and for people of color and probably actually for white males as well. So um, I, just lots and lots of changes to help everybody feel like they belong and that they are going to thrive so long as they actually work hard and get help. I, I love those examples because they speak to you know what I think is one of the larger barriers, which is access. If you haven't had access to this kind of education in the past, you might feel discouraged to continue on. And so I, I, I love I love that example of how you all you know separated the course to to encourage folks to you know just come if they're interested, come in and try it and see and see how it goes. Um, I'm curious uh, what you think, Kate, uh, having entered the field. Um, in, in the last you know, 20, 30 years, you get a sense that there are shifts happening from when you were a student um, in the early 2000s to now, as you look at scientists coming up uh, in NASA? Yeah, I've definitely seen an increase in female participation in, um, in meetings and other events that I've done. There's a part of that that's probably a passage of time. There's a part where I went from being, you know, a pure math and computer science and undergrad to something very interdisciplinary now. But there are more and more women that I'm seeing in meetings. And it's, it's really helpful, I think, you know, again, the feeling of belonging and seeing people that look like you is really important. Um, and I also just want to echo what Maria just said. I think it's really important to recognize that you know, not everybody is starting from the same spot. And so that sort of first level of intro is really important. And I've experienced this a lot in interdisciplinary work. When you walk in and you talk to someone that's from a different background than you, the first day is really just about vocabulary and language and making sure you're using the same words. And then you can hit the ground running and really appreciate what everyone brings to the table. But there's a part of it that's just making sure we're on the same page, making sure people are being heard and making sure everyone feels like they belong. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. I think that's a great point. Um, I, I also want to acknowledge that there's still a lot of friction points, you know, uh, for example, you know, Harvey Mudd has obviously made huge strides and some inst institutions have followed suit, have made changes, but there is still really a long way to go to reach parity. The only STEM field where women outnumber men is in sort of the healthcare field. And even there, they're more likely to be in lower paying jobs. Um, and after the pandemic, many are actually exiting the field in part because of a lack of support for care responsibilities as well. 
women today are about 47% of mathematicians, 40% of physical scientists, and just 15% of engineers. So I think there's still a long way to go. And Maria, I'm curious what your thoughts are on why, with so much attention on this issue over time, are we still a little stuck? Well, I, I'm going to focus on, on computer science and electrical engineering, mechanical engineering for right now. Um, and, you know, part of this is that there has been a, uh, the tech industry uh, has created a huge demand in these areas. And over the pandemic, that demand just grew, whereas the demand uh, lessened in lots of other areas. And so there's been a huge influx of people wanting to major, particularly in computer science and data science. And one of the unfortunate things is that many institutions, when they have to deal with that increased demand, they put in place uh, controls to control the demand that tend to discourage women and people of color. So for example, if I put in a GPA control that says you only get to major in computer science if you have A's in your first two classes, this is going to sound ridiculous, but it, it's just true that it will discourage more women and people of color than white and Asian males. And, and I mean, we just know from research that if a woman who was getting A's got an A minus, she will just decide that she doesn't really belong there. Whereas a guy who's been getting B pluses or B minuses, he will assume the reason that he's not getting A's is because the prof is not very good or the TA is not very good. I mean, it's just, it's just sort of crazy. So um, I, it's clear that if we change how we teach and if we create supportive environments, that women and people of color will thrive. And we just need to do more of that at many more institutions. Now, one thing I want to say to Kate, which I think she will love, is uh, we're very interested in climate change research and education at MUD. And we are starting joint majors between math and computer science and climate science. And we think that it's going to be in just that much more interesting to women and people of color, because understanding how you can use math and computer science to actually positively influence the direction of the planet doesn't get much better than that. So that sounds fantastic. We need more people that have the technical skills uh, to bring to climate change. Oh yeah, and 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 of course, as we've seen, you know, there's a lot of gender implications as well with climate change. We have a climate and gender reporter who covers this area, and it's you know I think something where the connections between the impact on your communities, you know, you know, for example, we you know women are you know leaders in their communities, oftentimes, particularly women of color, and 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 those connections seem to be really important. Um, so I, I I love that you mentioned that, Maria, and that y'all are thinking about that. Um, I also wanted to talk about something that Kate mentioned a little bit earlier, which was seeing yourself represented in the workforce. It's a big, big, big um, thing that we've talked about for, for a long time. Um, I was I was talking uh, to Kate earlier and I mentioned, you know, I was a space reporter before I started this job. And one of the biggest stories to emerge um, in the past couple of years has been the amount of women that have been elevated to really prominent positions at NASA for the first time and at other space organizations. We have the first woman leading a human space flight program. We have a mission to put the first woman on the moon. We have, like I said, women leading several major private companies. You're the fifth woman to serve as, uh, as the chief scientist, Kate. And we know broadly why representation is important, but there are also smaller things, right? Not being the only woman in a meeting, not being, you know, having mentors who can help guide you getting equal access to promotions. So I was hoping you can point to how some of these changes that NASA is undertaking externally are filtering into the culture internally. Yeah, so I think, it, first of all, it's, you know, inclusivity is a really big priority at NASA and listening to everyone. And one of the things that I have noticed throughout my career is that, you know, 
making a space for people to share. So often if you just like have a meeting that's just free form conversation, there's a small number of voices that tend to dominate. They're more confident people. And a lot of other people that have really amazing ideas don't really always shine through. And I think building a community and a meeting structure that in, in and that enhances inclusivity is really important. And a lot of the meetings I attend are like that, where everyone has an opportunity to say what they think, um, whether it's your area of expertise or not, we want to hear that. And I think part of it is, you know, if you look at the kinds of work that NASA does, you can't build a rocket or go to the moon without a big team. Um, and the more perspectives you can hear on that, the better the science is, the better that we are. And so I think that's really important. But there's also small things. So one of the things that I really like that NASA has put out recently is we have a graphic novel about a little girl that goes to the moon and just sort of putting out that information and showing people, you know, this could be you. I think that's really important to see, to see yourself in, in, in possible future careers is really important. And so that's been really exciting here to see. Wow. That sounds fantastic. I just want to say that our view book for mud uh, this year is a graphic novel. <laughs> it's, oh, that's great. In thing. <laughs> yeah, maybe y'all should talk to each other after this, see how you could do more, do more graphics work. Um, I, I also really want to acknowledge, you know, that, of course, we still, again, there are a number of areas where we're still, you know, a lot of work can still be done. And particularly when we're talking about women of color, um, LGBTQ plus folks, people who are really underrepresented in many of these fields. Uh, Maria, I was hoping you could talk to a little bit more about what Harvey Mudd has been doing recently to attract students from diverse backgrounds, and how do you think those initiatives could translate to the professional workforce? Uh, well, the first thing I want to say is, um, you know, I've been at Mudd for 16 years, and when I arrived, we were about 30% female in the student body, about less than 1% Black in the student body, and about 5% Hispanic. And the numbers today are um, well, obviously 50% female and including across all disciplines, uh, over 20% Hispanic and uh, our incoming class this year and last year was about 25%. And uh, we, in the last two years, we've seen a really major increase in black students as well. So uh, last year we were maybe 8.4% officially African-American according to government data, but um, government, <laughs> you don't get to count multiracial students as black. And so if we count multiracial students who present as black as well, we were about 17.7% uh, last year. And this year, I think we're over 15%, uh, maybe 7.6 for the government number. So those are huge increases. And, you know, it's of course not enough to get them in the door. It's really important that you manage to create a, a, a welcoming environment where everyone feels a sense of belonging. So we've been working really hard on that. And probably my favorite uh, comment from this year was a, a meeting I had with a black first year student and a Latinx first year student. Um, and the, their comment about MUD was, they're saying, you know, MUD, you can hang out with everyone <coughs> in our high schools. <coughs> where you had to hang out with students of the same ethnic background. And um, by the way, happy birthday to your puppy. <laughs> he's, he's, he was going to do it at some point. He was going to make himself yeah. known. For sure. Students were able to share with people from their own background. Well, so, I mean, what they were telling me is, if you're Black, you can hang out with other Black kids or with other white students or without other Latinx students or with gay students or trans students. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very welcoming, supportive community. And that's taken a lot of work. I, I mean, I don't want to say uh, change is hard wherever you do it, uh, but it's made a big difference. Thank you for sharing that. I think that is really important. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you think about that as well, Kate. You, know, you mentioned you, your work is really interdisciplinary. You're working with different areas uh, at NASA at all times and different teams. And how do you think about uh, representation and, and um, access and opportunity when you're working with these teams, when you're building a team? How, how does that play out for you? For me, it's really thinking about creating a space where people feel welcome, just as Maria was mentioning, and trying to you know, break down those barriers. And, and again, like in an interdisciplinary 
or for anyone that's new, it's, you know, things that make it hard to engage are things that, you know, things like acronyms or words we don't understand. And so trying to sort of, you know, make sure we're all speaking the same language to start creating spaces where people um, do feel like they have the ability to contribute and that their voices are heard and acknowledging those. And I think also mentorship is just really important. And so, you know, having peer mentors and people that are more senior than you that, that, that help you figure out your way in the new world, I think is really important um, as you're getting engaged and, and belonging um, and trying to, to, you know, find your way forward in, in a new field or in a new environment. I'm wondering if there were experiences that both of you had that come to mind as, you know, this is, this is the thing that I want to avoid. This is the, the thing that I want us to move away from experiences that stick out in your mind as moments that were, you know, difficult as, as women in your respective fields um, that, you know, you, you've sort of taken some lessons from and, and, and maybe are, are thinking about as, as, as you move forward. I, I wonder if there's anything that sticks out um, in your mind. I'll give you one from uh, probably around 1998, 1999. And I had just been uh, elected to the council of ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, which is the lead sort of professional computer science uh, association in uh, in the United States and Canada. And um, they were talking about uh, a conference that was going to happen in 2001, which was going to be across all areas of computer science. And uh, there was a, a group of people who were organizing it and they had a list of names of speakers. And there were, let's say, 40 names on the list. How many women do you think were on that list? Um. Go and uh, and so I asked the obvious question, which was why aren't there any women on that list? And I got the standard answer, which is, oh well, there just aren't women who are at this level of you know like leadership and uh, seniority in the field. And because I've been doing this for a very long time, I of course was able to say, well, yes. What about and, and give them a list of 15 names. And they were sort of, uh, well, one thing that came out of that was I was asked to run for the vice president position of ACM in the next election. Uh, of course, we did end up with a bunch of speakers that was much more representative than the original list, but it's just so common. I've had this happen over and over and over again that I'm presented with a list that is supposed to be the obvious people we'd invite or consider for some distinguished position. And they're either, you know, out of let's say 40 names, there are either zero, one, two, three, or four women on the list. And, uh, and, and you know, I've just learned that you always have to have a, a list of members of underrepresented groups. So now I have a list of black people and a list of brown people, as well as, um, as well as women. I'm sure Kate has had similar experiences. Yeah, one that stands out for me, this is probably you know, early in my career, I went to a meeting where I was the only woman, and it was probably 40 or 50 men in the room. And I actually didn't notice initially, they were all very, you know, welcoming, I felt like my voice was heard. And then someone pointed out to me that I was the only woman in the room. And it was that moment that I'm like, now I'm uncomfortable. Um, and what I realized when I think back on it is, I don't think that person was ill intentioned at all. I think from their perspective, it was just an observation. But for me, it highlighted how I was different than everyone else in a way that maybe I didn't want to highlight. Maybe I wanted to just be another scientist in the room. Um, and so I think that part of what I took from that is, I don't always think people are ill intentioned. I think they're just not always aware of how people hear what they say. Um, and so that I've, I've always tried to give people the benefit of the doubt, but it does sort of highlight that awareness is a, is a gap right now in terms of inclusivity. So yeah. I have another example, if I can add it. So, and I'm sure Kate has had this experience as well. You're the only woman in the room or you're one of two out of 15 or whatever. And you say something, and there's having uh, there's a group discussion about something or other, and you say something and nobody hears it. And then a little bit later, somebody else says the same thing. And a, 
a male says the same thing, of course it's heard. So I came up with a strategy that works really well for this. I will admit that now that I'm older and I have, you know, hair that's almost white, uh, it happens, and I'm better known now, it happens less often. But the following works, um, pick a buddy who's male and just ahead of time, and just make sure, just ask him to repeat whatever you say if it's not heard. And then when it gets heard, your buddy says, oh yeah, I'm Maria said it first. <laughs> and it's funny, like it's not, I, I, it raises awareness, but it doesn't cause, I mean, I think what Kate said is super important. I, we're all raised in a gendered and racist society and we all come with biases. And most of the time it is not, it, it is not deliberate at all. So it's just helpful to have a sense of humor. I love, I mean, the ingenuity, <laughs> the de degrees sometimes we have to go to, 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 to find ways to make this work and, um, and to be heard. Right. And so um, I thank you. Thank you both for sharing both of the, um, those stories. Um, I, I wanted to bring us to the current last couple of years in the pandemic. I think that's something that we certainly need to talk about in the past two years have exposed, you know, many of these fractures that we've been talking about in the field. And particularly when we talk about lack of care infrastructure support for women um, in all fields that are dominated by men, but certainly STEM. And there was a study I think that was published last year that found that women in academic STEM fields were facing increased isolation that was limiting their ability to collaborate with colleagues and progress in their careers. They were disproportionately affected by remote work and about gendered expectations around caregiving. We know that women have a harder time progressing in careers because of these expectations that are set on them and, um, and have oftentimes less access to promotions as a result. Um, and so I'm wondering, for you both, have you seen some of these long-term implications of the pandemic begin to play out? Um, and can you point to any places where you think the pandemic might actually help shepherd in some change in terms of reshaping uh, some of these long held notions and expectations in the field, which oftentimes is kind of some of the stuff under the surface that is blocking women from, from progressing in their, in their fields. One of the things that I thought was very interesting was that our students actually did better during the year that education was entirely online. And I, uh, and, and this is for both male and female students. Um, and I credit this to a couple of things. One is that our faculty was absolutely extraordinary in terms of moving online with all, learning online with almost no warning. And also I want to credit the Center for Teaching and Learning at the Claremont Colleges because they were really helpful in helping faculty figure out how to take things and put them online. But I would say the other thing was that there were fewer distractions. And we also found out that more students were likely to go to office hours. It's just really interesting because, because it was completely effortless. And so... Um, on the other hand, I will say that our, we have a lot of young faculty with small children. We have we, about 40% of our faculty are female, which is pretty high for a, a, a STEM institution like MUD. And um, there's just no question that caregiving, I, caregiving was hard for all of our faculty with young children. And, um, I mean, the other thing that I would say now is that uh, when we look at our first year students who did their last year of high school online, particularly for students from lower income families, their preparation is just not great. And we need to invest a lot of resources to helping them get through their, we are investing a lot of resources to helping them get through this year, but I mean, I think we're going to see across society, we're going to see a generation of students who were disadvantaged by uh, doing anything in K through 12 education during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Yeah, I think we've certainly seen, um, you know, some of some of those barriers to access really play out during the pandemic, both in the education and, um, and in the professional workforce um, as well. I'm, um, do you have any thoughts on, on, on that, Kate? Have you seen any changes 
um, within your workforce as a result of the pandemic, responding to some of the needs that folks had? Well, I would say one thing I've noticed both, you know, in my previous role in here is, is sort of, I think we we're more recognizing that people are different. Um, people need different things to motivate, p- different things to be productive and focused. There are some people that need engagement with other people in order to really be that their best. Others need to, you know, quiet. And I think the, the pandemic sort of enabled that. And so I think that was something for me is that not everyone's the same and recognizing that. I would also say one of the things I've noticed is about science conferences. Um, and so there's, I think, positive and negative that have come out of the pandemic. On the negative side, we're missing this in-person interaction and networking, which can be really important for career development, particularly for early careers. The ability to meet senior scientists and engage with them is really important. And we're not getting that with virtual conferences. But on the other hand, there's a lot of people that have been able to participate in virtual conferences they may not have been before, either because they didn't have the financial resources or family situations didn't allow them to travel and they can now participate remotely. And I think that that's a real benefit. If we can find a way to continue to facilitate facilitate that process, I think that that would be good. And then just on another note, I actually have really appreciated in the pandemic that we see people's pets and kids on the screen. Like, I think it makes us more human. And I think you're more likely to relate to people and hear people if you see them as a as a person, not just as a worker. And so I've really appreciated that. Well, my dog just heard you and he he's very happy that you said that he's (laughs) Flynn is very pleased with that comment. Uh, he's, he's my little partner during the days now. Uh, so finally, I wanted to wrap this up um, asking you both about your vision for, for parity, uh, for parity in STEM. Obviously, we've laid out what some of the existing barriers are, what some of the strides have been. And certainly it seems like, like I said, I think there's still ways to go. And you're, you're, I think you're both are great examples of folks in that space that are starting to change some of some of those expectations. I'm, I'm wondering if you could tell me one big thing and one small thing that you think could move the needle. Oh, I hate to say this because I've been saying it now for like 40 years, but I would just love for there to be a sitcom on TV with engineers who are people who have a life, who have kids, who have romantic partners, and who are all genders and races. That, I, I, I again, speaking to the ingenuity piece there, I, I love that idea. Um, is there, are there, are there smaller things that you would like to see happen? I think uh, more diverse faculty in STEM areas makes a huge difference. Um, it's, it certainly helped us a lot. It matters a lot that you see people like Kate's math teacher. And by the way, my advanced math, I, we didn't have calculus in high school when I was in 12th grade, but my advanced math teacher was female. I was the only female in the class and she teased all the boys because I always got a hundred percent and the class average was 44% or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. She doesn't remember exactly what it was. Something, something, something around there. Um, what about, what about you, Kate? What's, what's your big vision and your small vision? I guess my big is something very similar. I, I want people to be able to see themselves in the roles that they might want and that to not be a barrier. And I think a sitcom is a great way to do that, but there's probably others as well, but something where, you know, if a little girl in middle school is thinking about where they might go, that they see people that look like them and all of the possibilities and that that's not a barrier. In terms of something smaller, I think more mentorship. Like, I just think it's really important both to have someone that more senior than you that you can talk to and look up to and figure out how they did what they did. And then also someone that's your peer that can sort of relate on a day-to-day basis. I think it's just, if we could facilitate that a little bit more and make sure people have someone to talk to. Well, thank you both for that and, and for, for your insight. It, you know, it sounds like, um, you know, some of these big buckets that could really use, you know, a little bit of help continue to be, I think, at the forefront of what we want to focus on with STEM and with the future of STEM. And I think with the pandemic, there might be, we, we'll still see sort of the effects of that play out over time. So I'm curious to see how that plays out. But thank you both for your time, for your insight, for your ideas, big and small, uh, me and Flynn down here uh, are really happy to get to talk to you today. Thank Thank you. you so much. And nice to meet you, Kate. Yes, nice to meet you.